before we get into into the presentation and do the the whole intro thing, um, tell me about this website. You're the the copier rep. This is like the coolest website I've ever seen. Um, Which one? The co uh, copierwarrior.com. Copierwarrior.com. Cool. Yeah. So I built that back in 2013. Um, it's been updated like it updated in 2017, I think, but. I quit the copier industry in 2019, started the sales rebellion and kind of took the principles and teachings that I gave and learned as a copier rep and brought them into more of a agnostic approach toward like a sales vertical itself and more just the principles and alignment of what salespeople should be thinking, doing, practicing on a daily basis. But yeah, the copier warrior, I was just a sales rep when I built that and put that video on there and created my own. Basically, it was a landing page back before there were landing pages. So, and I just kept it the way that it is. I think there's integrity and in like just its kind of core. So I just never really changed it. I just added some cool stuff, like when you scroll through it, but. That's man, so awesome. I was so, so stoked to see that. I was thinking like, if I was in, if I was, I spent most of my like early career in sales and I had an about me page because this was like 12 years ago, something along those lines. It was, it was a long, um, shit, that'd be, that'd be longer ago. Um, yeah. but that was my like exploration into like, what does DNS stand for? How do I do all this? How do I do that? And so I saw yours and I'm like, dang, this guy, like you one upped me in a, in a real big way. Um, <laughs> so much, much respect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, in my defense, YouTube wasn't even a thing yet when I'm thinking about this. Um, yeah. so like getting video online, like, let alone creating my, my own trailer for myself. <clears throat> Genius. Yeah. Bro, we had, as so I started all that in 2009, like we had QR codes, you know, I had these like big old business cards me fighting copy machines and you know it would it would take you on the back of it like take you to my web presence and i really wanted like the internet to be a thing for me because i was in a band before that and i was myspace was massive when i was a band yep or in my band and so we became like one of those bands that blew up overnight because of myspace and our record label you know we got side of warner brothers so dang i i saw like what the in the power of social networks and what the internet did for me firsthand and so i thought why doesn't the b2b space take advantage of this and so lo and behold that's crazy and bear with me while i'm pouring coffee um if that's you're cool. in chat i hope uh maybe a little reminder for yourself go grab some coffee we're gonna we're gonna buckle in and, and get going in about eight eight minutes here um, so grab yourself a cup of coffee, glass of water. Um, I'm going to continue grilling Dale on his incredible website. I'm curious stats wise. Um, what, so first question stats wise, what did it produce? Maybe more important though, Torlando, um, is asking what was the band name and can you hook us up with your MySpace link? <laughs> it's still up there somewhere. Nice. Um, they reformatted the whole website though. So it's much different looking now, but. Uh, the band was called Imperial. Our signature album on Warner was We Sail at Dawn, but we've got three albums that you can find either through iTunes or Amazon or in the world. Whoever wants to go and try and find me, feel free. Imperial, We Sail at Dawn. Yeah. We were a heavy metal band. That that checks out. <laughs> nice. Here, I'll throw a link to, to Imperial Sail at Dawn. Um, I'll throw it in the Slack community. So if you're in there, you check that out there. And here we go. Sweet, man. And so let's talk about, um, talk about metrics. So did the, like, did you find that that website was helpful? Did it set you apart? Did anybody click on it? I had 10,000 views of that website one month. No way. And, and I wasn't, I was just going door to door basically. So yeah. I, I, it was just rumor mill basically like that. There was this guy with this website and that I got picked up by the media i got picked up by not just locally but nationally i got picked up by manufacturers especially the ones that i represented at my private firm so they were starting to say like do you want to write for this magazine do you want to blog for this article i mean it it was pretty overwhelming at first um but but i loved it i loved it i loved it a lot because again like i think of my music days it was perfect fit for me to be back in that same type of position so I was, I was into it, but yeah, the website was great, dude. I mean, it still gets, you know, a couple thousand hits a month and I don't promote it at all. So 
people just find it kind of like how you just did. So you just added to my analytics. <laughs> it's funny because sometimes it gets more hits than the sales rebellions website. So I, I joke that I can always go back to copiers anytime I want. So totally, man. It's and copiers is a hard game. Um, yes. I never, I was never directly in copiers, but I've definitely done door to door. I've definitely done heavy equipment and machinery. And I've certainly, I know a ton of people at Xerox here in Vancouver. There's some, there's some really good people, um, good people here. But, yes, uh, and it, man, it's such a, like, you really cut your teeth. Like you go from like either zero to expert or zero to different profession in a very short period of time if you're in copiers. Yes, I did 10, I did 10 years as a selling or an individual contributor and then five years four to five years as a manager or a VP of sales, but I was a selling manager and a selling VP of sales. And, and that's just, that's like, really, that just comes out of the, the morals, ethics and values of the way that somebody runs their business. And it, personally, I feel that way because if, if you would rather me sell and not lead, that's you being selfish. And, and so I, I did, I stayed with those firms, right. For some time, but I, I, in those moments made decisions for myself that these were not going to be my forever homes because all they cared about were the numbers and I wanted to develop people. So I said goodbye at some point. Right on. And so what, what did that journey look like? And I'm sure we'll get into a little bit. We're going to be talking pipeline today, but I'm curious sort of the, what's the origin story of the sales rebellion? So really, if you go back to 2010 is when you'll find that we originated the ideas of what the sales rebellion teaches, the principles the process slash system that we have, it all started developing at that point in time when I started to really spread my wings and fly as a sales rep and just crushing numbers, writing a million in net new sales a year and copier sales as a commercial down the street rep, you know, and eventually becoming a major account rep only really for a year and maybe two in total. But um, the sales rebellion was always this thing in the back of my head. And it was, it was who I, who I am, you know, this big rebel that just goes out and does all these things that the whole entire industry told us we couldn't do or shouldn't do. And I always just questioned why, you know? And so really like when, when you look at our rebellion, it's not a violent one. Like our rebellion is built on hope and the basis of sales being something a lot more altruistic than we treat it as, or we act it out as at the same time. So. I started to look at sales as something where we could apply servant leadership, apply these methodologies of basic human communication to get to the core of, a, of another human being instead of what it is that you're trying to sell them in the first place. So because of it, it opened up massive amounts of relationships for me. And, and over time, eventually, you know, I, I got that, that call where someone said, hey, I'm tired of not being able to hire you uh, because you won't leave your firm. But what about if you train my people? And, and I, I, a light bulb went off and I started writing a book that was back in 2018 and which I just announced the release of, um, like three days ago. Nice. What's the name um, of the book? Yeah. It's called how to start a sales rebellion. So we'll be, we'll be putting up a landing page and getting the, the marketing really rolling here in the next couple of days. For now, we're just hyping the living shit out of it, like using social media, like crazy. So <laughs> Beautiful. Well, if you're interested, you can join the Slack. I'll throw it in the announcements channel there. And uh, there we go. Along with Imperial, we sail at dawn. Um, I'd play it now, but it, if I play it on my computer, it goes up to YouTube and then Warner's going to come after me for royalties because <laughs> we didn't get, we didn't pay ahead of time and this and this and that. And, and er, early in my career, I made a mistake with like, I took an image from Google Images and I used it on my site without realizing it It was like originally from Getty and they tracked me down. And that cost me to me at the time was like it cost me a third of my bank account. It wasn't a that's, huge that's bank account, but it, it was a it was a big enough hit that I will um, not forget that and, and try yeah. not to make the same mistake. Yeah, Guys, I'm going to sure. uh, hop in here just to uh, share a couple of the housekeeping things before we jump into the living pipeline. Um, so I just want to remind you all, those of you joining us now on the live stream, um, join the Slack community. So we've got the link there for you to join. Um, this is where Dale is going to be hanging out 15 minutes after his session to answer any of the questions that go unanswered during the session. You guys can network there. You can, you can uh, catch those answers that any of the the speakers had after their sessions. Um, if you haven't attended them and if you want to be kept up to date 
with all of the sales content that we produce, our weekly live stream, our podcasts, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Look at that. I even got a cool graphic to go along. Dale can't see it because he's in Zoom, but YouTube can. Marketing team, rev team did a great job there. Thank you, Sarah, for the housekeeping. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, chat. So good to see we've got like a good balance of um, good balance of individual contributors and uh, and managers. It's probably about 50-50. Uh, um, but again, if you're new, if you're just jumping into the stream, we're going to get started with Dale's chat on pipeline in a minute. Um, but uh, let me know if you haven't already. Uh, one for individual contributor, two for sales leader. Let me know in chat. All right. So Dale, starting a sales rebellion. We're talking pipeline today. Um, I'm super excited. I hope nobody has told the empire because you know they're coming after you. How big of a Star Wars fan are you to name your company? I'm assuming after Never. Star Wars. <clears throat> well, you you caught me, dude. It's ma <laughs> it's a massive it's a massive uh, part of my life. My mom let me watch the first the first episode of Star Wars, which is not episode one for all the <laughs> nerds out there. When I was about six years old, seven years old, and yeah, that was it. She tapped into that creative side of me by allowing me to kind of get into the science fiction realm and it, it just took off. So I've been a nerd ever since. I mean, I named my band Imperial and I named my company the Sales Rebellion, right? Like I, I and, and the best part was like how good I am at sales, like not to be braggadocious here, but I straight up convinced five other people in my band who did not like Star Wars to name my band Imperial, right? <laughs> so it was good. It was good. It was, it, it was a lot of fun. I, we actually, we toured through California and played with a band called TIE Fighter. No and they way. called it like Star Wars night. And it was awesome because it was just a bunch of kids throwing fake lightsabers around at a mosh pit. And it was amazing. One of the most amazing nights of my life. So, And I don't know how this is, I swear this isn't a plant. Uh, Sith Master in chat says, what's up? Uh, what's up, dude? <laughs> is this Star Wars live? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Dude. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So we're not talking Star Wars today. Uh, sorry, Sith Master. We are talking about sales. We are talking about pipeline. So Dale, I'm going to pass it to you. I know you've got some things to say. Um, there's a, a course that we're going to tease at the end that you can, you can jump in if you want to learn some of these tactics. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you've got... Um, I, I'll pass it to you, let you uh, jump in with your slides. And uh, everybody, Dale Dupree, leader of the Sales Rebellion, at your service. Yeah, thanks, Colin. And I, I appreciate y'all having me here today. And I appreciate everybody coming out and, and watching as well, too. Um, I'm pretty excited about presenting the Living Pipeline. I, I've been able to, to do this with my students. But over the last couple months, um, we've we had a couple opportunities now to be able to go and teach it as well. And so I've been I've been very much enjoying being able to kind of get the word out to the masses of the concept behind the living pipeline. Anybody that was already in the, the stream uh, got a little bit of an introduction about me. My name is Dale Dupree. I'm the founder and leader of the Sales Rebellion. Uh, shout out to the Sith Master, one of my loyal followers, I'm sure, uh, for coming out. <laughs> I'm totally just kidding, but <laughs> I was in the B2B space for quite some time selling copy machines, uh, which is probably one of the hardest jobs in the world. I mean, sales in general, right? Statistics say that it's the second worst job to have in the world. So the idea of like picking one of the worst professions and then going into a vertical that's hated by people in general and also ranked as in the top three of hardest jobs to have inside of sales was probably not the wisest thing that I did. But I'm a guy that enjoys challenges. And I also love the concept of risk. And, and because of those things, I decided there was really only one option to go and fail. And in the process of failing, I figured so many awesome things out about sales, about people, about community, about culture, about communication, about neuroscience. Um, and I've got a whole background on that too, that we can, you know, nerd out at some point if you want to hit me up, but let's talk about pipelines. This is the sales rebellions concept of the living pipeline. And, and let me tell you how this was founded. This was founded on a wall on a whiteboard that was like the size of a wall. It was the biggest whiteboard I ever remember having in my life. It was like 50 inches by 60 inches. I mean, it was ridiculously big on this wall. And I, I started to kind of map a buyer's journey on this wall. And for most of us, a pipeline is it really, it's a funnel. That's how we all kind of look at it in the sales world, or at least especially back in 2007, 
2008 when I first started in sales in B2B sales is that everything is a funnel, right? And and again, the the idea of a funnel really for any, to reiterate what that is to anybody that might be thinking like I don't know it or I c- try to forget about it is that you put people up in the top and then you shove them through as fast as you can out the bottom. And and you got to squeeze them through this real tight tube at one point that's uncomfortable and and you know there's negotiations and there's friction at times and and that's literally the way that I I saw the sales cycle working is that I saw that not to say that all salespeople are manipulative, but I saw a lot of manipulation inside of this process of what a funnel was. I also saw a lot of short-sighted concepts. And I thought to myself, okay, so we sell a product in the copier space that goes out on average a lease of 42 months, right? So people typically tend to, to lease a copier in a, between three years and five years before the equipment is obsolete and needs an upgrade. And I thought to myself, so if we walk in somewhere that has one of our pieces of equipment, but they have three years left on their existing lease, we just walk away from that. We just walk away and we come back in three years and just try to slam them through our funnel as fast as we possibly can. And so I started to create this concept of the buyer's journey for me, not not for anybody else, but just for me. Like, what is the buyer's journey for me? Not necessarily what a guru says or, or, you know, even what I'm teaching you all today, you know, like. I'm not saying that this is a perfect system. I believe that this will help you to understand your own system better and hopefully give you a couple of nuggets to be able to add to your process because a a real rebellion is built on rebels themselves. And so the sales rebellion as an organization is built on our community. And we believe that in most cases that it's our students that have the best ideas that come out of what it is that we build to begin with. But jumping into this understanding of what the living pipeline became and is, you, you have to understand the, the premise, right? Like, like I was saying, where I was motivated to do something different because of what I saw a pipeline unfolding inside of my own walk in sales. And I started to think, well, I want to build relationships. I'm a relationship salesperson. So if you're rolling your eyes right now, I'm not your guy by any means. I believe that people do business with those they like and trust. My father was in business for 29 years owning his own copier firm. And when he died at his funeral in 2016, there were people that did business with him for those 29 years at that funeral. He had an entire account base of people that had come on from the very first day he started his business to the very last moment when he sold it. And to me, like that was a, a big defining factor in my walk in watching my father live out this uh, path to, to servant leadership and, and to maintain a very good reputation inside of a community for the course of that many years. Um, and so if you're, if you're wondering, I did, I started my copier career with my dad and, and honestly, I probably would have been fired if it was anybody else. Cause imagine a guy with hair, like down to here and big old holes in his ears and tattoos all over him going out and selling copy machines. Like my dad believed in me. <laughs> and so he gave me an opportunity. And it took me a couple of years to really get into my stride, but I became the number one rep at the organization. He sold the business. And in the process of that, I became the number one rep at the new organization, which was a $25 million firm that just grew and grew and grew. um, And eventually ended up at a $2 billion firm. So you want to talk about the idea of the, the buyer's journey. You have to also understand your own journey. What are your experiences? What are things that are preferential to that experience as well too? You know, and, and throughout the process, we're meeting people constantly. And so for me, it was this idea of always be marketing, always be building relationships, always be proactive in our sales cycle, right? So we, we talk a lot in the sales rebellion about foreshadowing, right? And, and also this, this concept of what does the strategy look like for your pipeline as well too? You know, most people are guilty of having a 90 to 120 day pipeline and that's it. You know, if you're not 90 to 120 days out in, in equipment sales or some service sales, don't want to mess with it, right? And and on top of that, think of if you're in a culture that is very fast paced around the sale itself, where sometimes it's just weeks before people buy, maybe it's subscription based. You don't even have a 30 day pipeline. You have like a four day <laughs> pipeline. No, but people, the thing that we forget is that people are existent outside of those 30 days, those 90 days, those 120 days. And that's that's the travesty behind a pipeline. So what we did is we created this concept of these, these three different um, 
sections of what the, the pipeline is itself. I'll give you a quick overview of it. The first is the roots, called the rebel's roots. And these are the four cores of the rebel's roots, our service, our habits, what we call knowledge, know for short. Um, it's an acronym. And then reason, which is also an acronym. And the, the concept of these four things is what every rebel lives and breathes in order to create the, the necessary impact inside of their community that is needed in order to build a living pipeline to begin with. So we get a little deep with this, with this subject, right? Because one of the things that people don't talk about enough is the ability for someone to know themselves, right? And so this is a concept of awareness. The roots are an awareness. The roots are this, this idea of not just being aware of yourself though, but being aware of others, situationally aware as well too. A, a really good salesperson is usually not the loudest in the room, right? <laughs> a really good salesperson is the, is the one that is talking the least in most cases as well. But when they speak, they move mountains with their words because the things that come out of their mouth have a purpose. They're not just, it's not just banter. It's not empty, but it, there's reason behind it. There's knowledge to it. There's a habit and a consistency in it. And everything is riddled with the concept of servant leadership. So we, we walk up to the base of the tree and you're probably looking at that weird word with the X and like, what, this guy is so strange. It's actually the name of my best friend. So quick side note, my best friend's name was Zach Fortune. When he got to elementary school, his teacher told him that nobody would be able to pronounce his name, which is actually social, which is what you're reading right now, X-O-C-H-I-L. And so his teacher, to keep him from being made fun of by the class, said, we're going to call you Zach. Is that okay? And of course, he said yes. And he became known as Zach infamously for, for many years to come. Zach is a huge piece of the puzzle of what the sales rebellion is. He brought me and my business partner together through friendship. And Zach is also a very loud, very proud person. Um, he unfortunately passed away in 2014, was hit by a car in New York and killed. Uh, Zach played in my band with me, Imperial. He played bass. You can't miss him if you find some of our music videos or some of our live shows, if you're out there really like deep diving into the dark web, <laughs> looking in, up my band. Uh, but Zach had long red dreads. His father was Haitian and his mother was Irish. So he had freckles, right? And he looked just like his dad, but he was white as snow. <laughs> was the, he was one of the craziest looking people you've ever seen in your life. And he was beautiful to me. Um, again, my best friend. And so we built an entire concept around like Zach is the essence and epitome of good marketing. <laughs> he is not only something that makes you turn your head and say like, whoa, that's different. But also when you speak to him or when you hear him speak, it moves you. It would cause you to feel differently about what you were even seeing in the first place. And so there's a principle here inside of the base of the tree, which is this idea that in most cases, when people are building a pipeline, they get on the phone or they send out an email and they give very basic information, very surface level requests. Can we meet about this problem? Can I show you this thing that we do? And because of that, you know, there's just kind of this mediocre movement throughout the, the sales cycle. But if you're loud and you can cause curiosity, um, you know, and, and when I say loud, really, I, I, I'm speaking of a structured sound, not an abstract noise, but creating this sense of curiosity and wonder in the person that is receiving this outreach, whether it's through marketing specifically, or just visualizing that your email outreach is marketing. <laughs> being able to give people experiences. This is what the, the, the living pipeline is all about. So at the base, we have these tools, these tools and these concepts that remind us of how it is that we're able to nurture a stranger into becoming somebody that ends up inside of a branch. Branches have different categories on them. And there's four of one and three of the other. And these are the base categories. I just want to explain that real quickly that uh, these these get pretty deep and they get they branch out even further as well too. But the base concept is that type uh, of branch is a passive branch. Uh, and then a time sensitive branch would be more of an active branch. And the concept here is that, and you're reading this and probably thinking that I'm even weirder. Like it just keeps getting weirder, right? Sith Lord. But the, the concept here is that we're trying not to stereotype people inside of the sales walk, right? Like I, I'm a believer in 
and seeing and understanding somebody's authenticity, but also by to do that, we have to understand their culture. We have to understand where they come from. We have to understand what makes them who they are. And so we've created these four branches that give a little bit of a sense around that type of person. All right. And, and once we have that, then we work on two specific things that we're going to talk about. Um, one of them is experiential sales campaigns that nurture a type into a time-related branch into a close. And the second would be communication specific to these types of branches, whether it's time-related or whether it's type-related. So you guys are probably all looking at the not interested branch right now. And, and the concept of what the not interested branch is that I want you to think about here is you all here not interested on a daily basis, right? We all do. There's no way around it. This is actually probably the biggest bucket that most salespeople have. And in most cases, there's a lot of different things that salespeople will do, but it's usually one or the other where we put them into the CRM and we maybe follow up in a year. Um, or we put them on an email marketing campaign that they unsubscribe from, <laughs> and then we have to somehow figure out how to get them back into it again, right? Or we just forget about them altogether. What a jerk, right? You know, and that's the mindset that we want to stay away from, both mindsets, really. Putting people into a process um, that's very rigid and robotic, or just forgetting about them altogether. The not interested branch was the best branch that I ever had inside of my sales career. When somebody told me that they weren't interested, I knew that I'd done things incorrectly from the foref uh, at the forefront of my, my outreach methods. I, and I also knew that, that there was definitely a need for my product because if there wasn't a need, they would have told me that. We don't have a copier. And so we don't need you, All right? But instead they heard oh, another copier person and said, not interested. So the, the concepts of these branches hopefully break down a little bit from that perspective. Like you can understand the perspective of it um, just from that little bit of information about that particular branch, but let's go through a couple of them. Let's talk about wild cards. How many of you have, have had a prospect or, or maybe even a client um, that you called up and, and maybe the, the first interaction was amazing. You know, holy cow, like we spent like 20 minutes on the phone and they told me to email them all this information and then the craziest things happens and they just kind of disappear and go away uh, because they are a wild animal <laughs> that you cannot control or define. And uh, this, this is probably one of the second most prevalent types, you know, when it comes to the, the living pipeline of people that you'll run into. You know, a lot of times with a C-level executive as well too, they're busy, right? They, they don't have the time. And so maybe you caught them in a weak moment or you caught them in a spot where they had 20 minutes. Uh, but now they're going to get back on the phone and they're going to get into other meetings and they'll talk to 400 other people. And then you will be at the bottom of that list. And so the next time you hit them up, they probably don't even remember you in most cases. We call this the wild card. The idea of the wild card though, is, is that they did speak with you and you can gauge their interest through that conversation. And most of the time, a wild card will give you some pretty, they'll give you good info and insight into the organization. They will typically they're not afraid to tell you that they have some type of need. Oh yeah, we, we use that product or, you know, we've been thinking about doing that, but you know, that's just what kind of paints this picture for you of, Oh my gosh, I found a sale. And then lets you down when they stop picking up the phone, when you start calling them again. So the concept of the wild card is specifically in this type of person that's inside of your pipeline is how do we re-engage them? How do we reshift the focus? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the experiential sales campaigns right now. This is the empty donut box. So whenever I ran into a wild card, I'm in the early stages of my sales career and, and the sales rebellion has about a dozen campaigns around this particular type in the living pipeline. But when I was first starting in my career, the donut box was probably the easiest and also the most accessible for me uh, without a budget per se before I started making the big bucks. I would go down to Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' Donuts, whatever you know, floats your boat. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Krispy Kreme kind of guy. I would get a dozen donuts and then I would get a box that was empty to go along with it. And I would take down this box. And in the beginning, this was just, again, very DIY. We manufacture these now and actually print on them, print into them. 
A lot of times, instead of getting a, a box that says Dunkin' Donuts, we nuance the brand on it as well too. So it becomes a very desirable piece of marketing. Uh, but when they open it, they see these, these empty rings, you know, from the grease of the donut and on the top of the box, written in red, almost like blood, it says, sorry, I ate all these waiting for you to get back to me. And as a, as a young rep, I would leave the 12, the dozen donuts with a receptionist and say, hey, but these are for Chris or for Nancy or for Drew. And, and uh, could you give it to them? And then these ones are for you. These are actually, these actually have donuts in them. And so I would, I would build rapport and, and build some trust as well too with the person at the front desk to let them know that I'm a pretty laid back guy and that I, that I will do anything from the perspective of take risks in order to make sure that I'm putting in the right amount of effort, the right amount of work ethic, the right amount of cause toward what it is that I'm trying to carry out in my local community. You know, by doing something that could offend somebody, you know, an empty box of donuts with, you know, lipstick, you know, writing at the top of it, of the box. And I would always put my phone number, you know, most of the time you would be driving out of the parking lot and you'd get a dial uh, of somebody laughing, asking if you had gone too far and if you could come back. So this is the concept of experiential sales techniques. This is the concept of taking a type of person that we all run into all the time. Yeah, I'm so interested in your product. Two weeks later, what happened? <laughs> Four months later, I still can't get you to write me back from my emails. Right? We have to interrupt their typical patterns. We have to go above and beyond to help them to understand what it is that we want in regards to a relationship with them, not just in regards to the commission check that we're chasing. And when we can relay that, we take it to a whole nother level. The whales and walruses. This is just the kind of the concept that really the most enterprise accounts need, but also as an SMB rep and a down the street rep, I use this to my advantage too, to understand that, that a whale is, is a very large account that has multiple decision makers in it. Not just this person that's been assigned to speak with you. Sometimes a board, sometimes a, you know, that person that you're, that you're with in particular has a boss. And sometimes that boss has a boss as well too. And understanding that there is kind of, there's a deeper route inside of, an organization when it comes to a major account specifically. A walrus is the concept of more of an entrepreneur type. I would essentially be a walrus. I don't have any other people that I need to run by a decision when it comes to doing something for my organization, except for my business partner, but we both have our own roles. And so there's things that people call on him for that he buys and things that people call on me for that I buy, right? And the idea is though, is, is that if you're running a $400 million firm, and this is a real this is there are com companies, especially in the e-commerce world, uh, um, as well, that are that are doing twenty million dollars to to four hundred million dollars, and they're working out of like I mean, intelligent offices. <laughs> it's wild, right? And I ran into that all the time in the copier industry, and understood that there was two ways basically to treat somebody that needed a lot of my product, and and that there was a multifaceted approach to this as well too. And so understanding this concept of, of the whale and the walrus and what they are for you as well too, is that they can be life-changing for your organization. They can be something that gets you, makes you a commission check so large that can completely change the quality of your life and the quality of life your company even provides to its employees and the growth inside of the community. And so there's a partnership between a, a, a company that, that falls into this whale or walrus status or category. Again, most of the, the teachings that we talk about here inside of the, the living pipeline are mindset focused. Uh, obviously, as I've talked about, there are also very tangible ways uh, and means that we teach in regards to getting people's attention, to setting the appointment, to delivering the proposal, to closing the deal um, that we're not going to necessarily go through. But it's the concept of this new proclamation of what sales should be, right? Every single day we go into what is, can feel like, I should say, a very busy world, very busy, very busy places where our name can just become another number in the bullpen. We can get lost in the crowd and the sea of other salespeople as well, too. And so having this concept around creating types and time indicators for, for your prospects, and let's talk about types specifically is the ability to be able to understand that there's more that you can do, right? Than just putting them back in the CRM and ticking them to call them in six more months just to get hung up on again. 
there is this concept of being the elite salesperson that my mentors always taught me. The elite salesperson isn't the guy that roll or the girl that rolls around, you know, in the $250,000 vehicle. They are the servant leader that is willing to go above the call of duty of what it is that they are asked of in regards to their role to make sure that others have the experience that they deserve. Nobody in B2B sales uses things like props. I used to go around with a, an instruction manual that showed people how to throw a brick at a copy machine and tell them that whenever it jammed or there was a problem with it, that they can use this brick and use these instructions to fix the copier. That's amazing. Can we, can we just pause? That's the, that's the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> was it an actual brick or is it a little rubber foam brick? It's, it's, a, it's a foam brick, so you can, you can squeeze its dressy ball. So, nice. But it, it, it is the concept of pain, right, Colin? Like, think about the problems that persist. And like when we write our, our quick synopsis emails or our mm -hmm. initial outreach emails and we, and we hit the pain, right? When we write about it, people translate it differently. But if you can hold the pain in your hand, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can live it. It's different. Yeah. I'm, I'm still stuck on your empty box of donuts trick. That's amazing. Um, I, I used to send people that were like avoiding me. I would send them, this is my boss's idea. It wasn't mine. Um, he said, get your, cause we worked at a, this is temporarily. I worked at a print shop for about eight months. And he said, go, go buy a dartboard from hardware store then print out a big picture of your face and jab a dart in it and be like, I bet you're sick of, and then like mail that to them. And I'm like, yes. or drop it off at the front desk in a big box. And I was like, are you insane? And man, did that ever get a reply? It was, it was quite possibly the craziest thing I, I feel like I've done. Um, or he's like, yeah, you yeah, do it, do that with, but with pizza, if you really like them, like put your face in there and like staple it to the box. And so, you know, but I think the dartboard was the best, but I, I, I'm, if I, I almost wish I could go out into the field and just to see if that, the empty box of donuts thing works. <laughs> <laughs> it drives people crazy more than anything because they, they're like, why are you coming back with donuts? <laughs> <laughs> we, have a, we had a rep in Canada that's in the, he was in the Toronto province and he was using the box campaigns. Mm. There's multiple boxes. There's donuts, there's pizza, there's cookies. Yep. There's, there's a, we have a whole theme behind all, we have a cadence behind all our, all of our outreach methods or our reinvigoration methods this is kind of what we call that inside mm -hmm. of the pipeline. And I mean, there wasn't, you, you probably know the territory to some degree, even though it's a different part of the country, it is, it is, it is a very, very busy spot. It's like me saying I sell in Orlando and then meeting somebody that sells in, you know, backwoods, Tennessee. Hmm. Right. It's very different. Right. And so so specifically in that place, you know, you don't have people just taking cold knocks. They're not interested. But by doing the empty box campaigns, I mean, he probably had nine out of 10 people that he was dropping to. He had a conversation with and I would say that about 40 to 50 percent of them turned into deals at that point so that it helps with your success rates from the perspective of prospecting more so than anything else. Totally. And I mean, it's it's. These are such cool things that you can do while you're in, um, like seeing people in person. So chat, let me know, like, what are, what are some things that you're doing right now that are like these sort of like pattern interrupts? Um, I've heard people, and hey, we got Bershu from Toronto. Um, I'm actually in Vancouver myself, so uh, opposite side, but I guess north of the line. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear chat. Let me know, how are you, how are you using these pattern interrupts? And then we'll, we'll get back to Dale. Um, but if we, if we could pause for a question here, um, yeah, I see it from Corey. My yeah, boy. Corey. What's up, Corey? <laughs> um, yeah, this is a great question. And I, I promise I didn't put Corey in here and, and have him softball me this. But this is a great question, right? Because it's, it is very applicable. Like people see what we're doing at the rebellion and they say, well, how's that working right now with COVID-19? Well, our reps specifically, like we could talk about my business all day long and I could tell you our growth, but does it really matter? Like our reps are what really matters that we train our reps are the number one reps of their companies. Our reps are seeing massive returns on persevering with these methods. And so one thing that people keep talking about is that, okay, everybody's working from home now, right? Well, nobody's giving out their home addresses. So how do we get stuff to them? Well, we started asking and then also studying, well, what's, how do people get the mail? How are people getting the mail? Like that's, they have to make a transition there as well too. So what's the transition look like? And so essentially internally, the HR department 
or a C-level executive that has the addresses is forwarding the mail. So there, maybe it's, it's more like once a week or even once every two weeks, but they're gathering all the mail that somebody has and they're forwarding it along. The second, the second thing that's happening is that somebody's coming in the office, going through the mail and deciding what is worth being forwarded on to begin with. So that means that your letters or anything that you're putting in the mail, like an empty donut box, you can mail an empty donut box, folks, believe it or not. You can mail almost anything, uh, which most people should know anyway. But if you were using the Rebel Letter Campaign, for example, this is the letter traveled around the world and specifically the envelope for it. This is the coffee stain letter itself that would be stuffed into said envelope, but not that specific one. There are four different themes to this. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine that somebody gets this in the mail. And that they or or an envelope with coffee stained right in the middle of it. Now suddenly, like I said in the in the second iteration of what people are doing with the mail, suddenly you become you have caused and and enacted and enabled a radical curiosity in that moment. Undeniable curiosity is really the way to say it, where they open it and they read it, and if it's different enough, you're in. And so that's where a lot of the reps are winning is that it's not just about putting this stuff in the mail and, and crossing your fingers as much as it's that there is a process. And so we have to be a little bit louder than all the other crap that they get mm -hmm. so that they understand it's worth their time to, to come back to us. But the third iteration of all this is you can take all these methods into the digital world through video outreach. And, but the, the only thing that I'd say to that is this, is that we see it working where you can actually like open the donut box and show people the messaging. And you got to have a little bit of acting skills there for sure. But we give out improvisation classes for anybody that wants to take those. And there's plenty in your local community as well, too, that you could probably do for free. But the idea is, is that if you can communicate correctly, the experience, not what your message needs to be to get them to take an appointment, but the experience that you want them to feel impacted by then you will win. However, I think it's it's like tripled. The statistic is, is that the amount of emails people were getting are getting now than before as a decision maker is like tripled. And that is cr a crazy thought. And so because of that, everybody should be thinking that the mail, even if it doesn't fa always hit right with everybody or it takes a couple of weeks and is delayed, mm -hmm. it's worth it because no one else is using it because everybody else thinks COVID-19 has caused the mail to not work anymore. Gotcha. Those stamps, are they from like, do you have stamps from around the world that you just like all over it? Or do you actually send it around the world? The <laughs> That'd be pretty sick. It's right? an $800 are... letter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, these are, they're repurposed. Um, they're, it's digitally designed. So oh, it's okay. all the, okay. all the different passport stamps repurposed onto the envelope, but they, we, we, change just enough of it so that it's not the postal service doesn't see it and actually think that it's being sent from or to another country mm -hmm. and you just put your postage up in the top right and these things they ship easy it's they like without a problem we've been doing it for a, i've been doing it for a long time yeah. and now people all over the world are doing it as well too but this is graphically designed all right so we got a website called crumpledletter.com where you can actually download a free version of one of the letters to see if it even is your cup of tea and then from there, you can purchase the whole campaign and everything's in there from the graphic side. But we, we recommend that people do things like that, where they have somebody build and design the cadence for them so that it's, again, that it is experiential. A lot of people send the, the coffee stain letter, for example, with coffee beans mm -hmm. in the bottom. Very lightly, they put a couple of coffee beans in. And so there's an aroma when you open up the, the letter itself. And so it gives people the five cents experience is the idea. So... That's amazing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking back to like, you're totally right about video and there's like, there's good ways, there's bad ways. I, the thing I always struggle with is like, and, and it totally depends on the size of your market and the size of your target account list. If you're dealing with thousands of accounts, there's no way I'm sending you videos. If I'm dealing with one account, I'm 100% going to invest a whole lot more time in whether that's video or whatever it is. Um, so like, how do you, how do you kind of triangulate? And I, I know we've, you've got some more slides and we got some more time here, but how do you sort of differentiate? Like, when is it right to send one of these? How much personalization are you putting into, into each one yeah, of these well, letters? Bro, we, I'll just tell everybody listening that like, if you're hyper personalizing things, you will get the responses that you desire. That the, the piece of the puzzle with the letter campaign is that it's a differentiator that feels personalized. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily have a bunch of personalization popped into it, but if you're good at automation and you're good at uh, Excel spreadsheets <laughs> and Microsoft <laughs> Word, you can, you can, 
mass produce a list where the name of the person that you're writing to is at the top of every single one of your letters and that they feel as if you're speaking to them in the way that, so uh, one of the things that I alluded to earlier is that I have a, not personally a background in psychology, but my wife does. And so I, my whole life, I had a psychologist who became a neuropsychometrist who was also studying to go to the FBI. And so she had a criminal and um, psychology degree as well too. As the person that I was ha having helped me with all my copy, mm. with all my marketing, with all my outreach, and also with disseminating an interaction and breaking down everything that happened inside of it that was outside of just an objection, but like the facial expressions, the patterns, the, the, the body language, everything so that I could understand better what copy was doing. And so when we write copy, even though we leave it up for interpretation for the salespeople that buy things like the crumpled letter campaign, we also put enough in there to help them see and think outside the box toward the way you use your words. And if you use your words correctly, it will feel hyper personalized to those you are writing because it will cause a sense of nostalgia or a sense of familiarity in those moments. And those are the things that we're trying to capture emotionally from people. And this is this is this goes for if you're writing somebody that's super analytical to if you're writing somebody that has a very dominant characteristic trait or somebody like me, that's just a social gorilla, right? You can do that in one style of writing and get to the core of that human being. Love it. And I want to get back to, we'll get back to your slides in a second here. Um, we've got a couple from, from chat. Drew was saying the best uh, cold call, like voicemail he ever got. The, the person on the other line said the voicemail was every night I talk with God. Why can't I talk with you? That is... That's not what I was expecting at all. Wow. <laughs> and then Tor Tor Torlando's, um, I guess, pa pattern interrupt or like conference strategy and not sure how they're how they're doing it virtually yet. It was just go to the conference and stay at the parties as long as possible. Um, I know I, my my business card collection rate would certainly go up at the uh, the end of the conference. And then at the next day, you're looking at me like, where did all these cards come from? I don't remember any of these people. <laughs> And then we've got a real uh, a question from Chelsea here uh, saying, hey, Dale, what's up? Talk about cadence a lot. Can you give some insight into what it might look like for prospecting and outreach? What's up, Chelsea? Thanks for coming. So oh, it's a plant. The... It's a plant. <laughs> <laughs> I just love my people, man. My tribe is so cool. It just makes me super warm. And it's so easy to do these kinds of presentations in a strange place with people I've never met because I know my tribe's going to show up. And so I'm grateful for that. Thank you to everybody that's out there in the tribe. But but th this one's important, right? Because the, the, the idea of prospecting and having a cadence with everything is this concept of that you tell yourself at the very forefront that I'm not going to get a conversation started on the first touch. And so you take the expectations away for yourself. And so you don't push to this limit that then shows that you're desperate to the prospect. Again, awareness of others is extremely important. And so if instead I'm looking to give somebody the experience that they deserve and one that they'll have a lot of fun with, you just talked about, um, you just talked about conferences. Let me, I'll throw one out here for everybody that wants to steal this. And, and also that goes with the idea of cadence at, cadences inside of outreach for prospecting is like, let's say that you have a list of a hundred people coming to this conference that hopefully will be happening sooner than later because of COVID-19. And the, the concept is, is that a lot of people do what? They call, they email and they say, hey, we've got a special round table and you should come and hang out. And here's a discount code when you get to the, our booth and this and that. Well, what if you just sent somebody like a literal treasure hunt, right? What if you were sending somebody a literal B2B treasure hunt? And what if you were doing something that was, again, like causing an experience, but also setting you up, not just for the first touch, but the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And then they show up to the event and what's going to happen? <laughs> they're going to show up and they're going to go and find your booth right away, right? Because now you've built something, you've built an experience. I like to call it Disney for sales. That's what I've been doing my whole career is Disney for sales providing people with something bigger than just prospecting and just a cadence, but an experience. This guy's crazy. I love him. <laughs> Corey, <for> affirming. <laughs> Corey, yeah. crazy in a great way. Um, Corey saying uh, he sent out hundred dollar bills asking for hundred bucks worth at the time. And then if they say no, tell them you're going to be stopping by to get your money back. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I actually, I, I did that with my cardboard cutout series. I did, I did 25 card or 20 cardboard cutouts 
of myself in the first iteration where I was stabbing a copy machine with a golden, a golden copy machine in the woods with a giant like Camelot sword. Mm -hmm. And, and it was a life-size cardboard cutout of me. And, and I had a note with it that said, if you don't want to take a meeting with me, cause you think I'm crazy, I'll be, I'm going to be by any way to meet you. Cause I need to pick this back up. It's very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very expensive. It's made, it's made out of cardboard. You worked at a French shop. You get it. Those no, things aren't cheap. Dude. No, no, I know. I'm picturing this. I'm like, oh yeah, it was like 87 bucks. No problem. <laughs> yeah, right. It was almost 150 actually. Oh, I, so I got, I got screwed. I should have freaking called Colin back then. That's should have called me. Problems. I, I think I was just, under, maybe I was just undercharging. <laughs> yeah, that could have been a tumor. Oh, yeah, those, those 87 Canadian dollars too. That's, that's almost free, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> All right, we got some we got some slides. Um, if you're in chat, like keep keep talking. We're gonna let Dale get back to some slides because we we do he does have a lot of things to say. He does have lots of uh, lots of slides. So I do want to respect the fact that he did a ton of prep for this. And uh, but we'll keep keep chat alive. We'll we'll do another one of these little interludes shortly. Yeah, we've we've only got a couple slides left. Really, what we want to go through now is we want to talk a lot about the time indication portion. You know, because this is where most salespeople live in general is that they have somebody that's a, that has acknowledged that they have a need, has given some type of illness you know, that you can fix, that is looking to be aligned with your product and, and is giving some type of schedule. You know, so they're saying, yeah, in 120 days, in 90 days, in two weeks, you know, July 13th, we want to make a decision, right? So this is an indicator that a lot of salespeople live by and are told on a frequent basis. This, we call this the money branch because 80% of your time will be spent with people on this branch as a salesperson. And that's not just me saying that I want you to spend 80% of your time with people on this branch. I'm telling you that through my whole career, when I measured my living pipeline um, concept, as I was you know, building it and creating it throughout the, the 10 plus years as a rep, that I realized and recognized that this was my branch that I that I I really had to put a lot of focus into because so when somebody is in a type and in a passive indicator and they have time before they're going to make a decision, really it's just about quote unquote staying in touch without ever sending that stupid email. That's a waste of of life to send that email. And I'm sorry if people are listening that have sent it and are and feel offended by me saying that. Someone said it to me one time just as harshly and it opened my eyes. And I'm going to tell you who said it to me. It was a buyer, not a salesperson. It was a buyer. And then it happened a couple of times. And I sat back and I thought, wow, they're right. It is extremely just, I mean, really it's bad form is what it is because what it shows is like a laziness to the buyer. Like, Hey, just checking in, you know, it shows that like you have no innovation in the way that you communicate that you can't create relevance in that, in that moment as well, as well too. And so it causes them to look at you very unfavorably in that moment. So in the money branch, we also talk about a very focused style of communication as well, because prior to it, we just want to build rapport, right? We want to build this idea that we are here to stay and create and maintain a reputation. And also pro tip would be that it's not just with your decision maker, get to know their company, right? Just because you have one person or two people or three people making the decision for the product itself doesn't mean that all 50 all 60, all 100 of the employees don't use it or are affected by it to some extent. And so having some type of reputation inside of the organization will go miles for you. Now, it, it might sound a little overwhelming, but look, I did it. I'm, I mean, I'm not that cool. I'm not, I'm not that good at uh, time management either. I have to constantly work on it day in and day out, right? You don't have to be this perfect person to make these concepts happen and work for you. It's about your intentionality. Do you want it? right? Are you going, have you decided that you're going to be the best copier salesperson in the world? Because that's what I had to wake up and tell myself every day in order to maintain this, this momentum and these concepts. So inside of the time-based branches, you know, there's a cut, there's a visual here that kind of gives you the idea of the specifics around what it is that we want the prospect to feel. Okay. And so like the, for instance, like the 3d glasses that are in here, um, one of the things that that needs to happen is instant radical education and and this idea of the prospect because in these shorter time frames what i want you to think about is that you typically have competition whether it's the incumbent or whether it's another outsider that's trying to come in and compete for the incumbent's business just like you 
But one way or another, you have become a number inside of their process at this point, even if they like you, even if that rapport that you've been building throughout the course of the living pipeline was working. This is the do or die portion of it, right? You can't suddenly forget about all the things that you've been doing. And, and so one of the things that I did as a rep was that I used QR codes um, and I used video, lots of it. And then at the Sales Rebellion, we use augmented reality. We actually have our own app called Rebel Vision. Um, and it'll actually be, uh, spoiler alert, part of something that we're releasing over the next several months. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is, obviously, because that'd be way too much of a spoiler, but that the public will be able to get access to um, just by downloading it from the app store. So for free. So, but again, the concept being that when you're in this, this shorter version of, of a pipeline and some, because sometimes think of it this way, everybody, that you might start in the time indication branches. You might not always be identifying the type. The type will be a complement in those instances because you'll be able to say, all right, they're this type. And so these are the types of communication styles that are appropriate, that will be effective, that will identify, uh, help me to find the identification of like what this relationship truly could be and can be based on the best methods of communication. But at the same time too, we have to add to it this experience concept. And so in this particular part of the, of the funnel, you got to get, you got to get a little dirty. You got to be, you got to be willing to go above and beyond. You got to be willing to do things like write a handwritten note. All right. How many of y'all that are listening right now have written a handwritten note outside of just like writing someone a happy birthday card. My dad taught me the power of handwritten notes a long time ago as a kid. And when I was 21 years old, 22 years old, going into B2B sales was one of the first things that I picked up after I met with people after I presented a proposal, after I closed them, I would write them a handwritten note and I realized the power that was being created around the relationship itself. And so this is what I want you to think about inside of the time branches, right? Is, is this idea of like, how do we be a part of their culture? How do we be a living organism inside of their ecosystem and not just the vendor? And it is, it is in this moment and during this part of the branch that we can really figure out specifically how we can do better, how we can relate more, how we can create and cause a familiar feeling that makes the prospect comfortable, how we can radically educate them to the point of understanding not just our product, but who we are and why they should trust us. It's one thing to say that I've got, you know, I've got a knock with, you know, a thousand people for tech support, you know, for my IT product that I'm selling. And it's another thing to feel like you alone are the knock with a thousand people that can give tech support. So it's an emotional pull that the prospect will feel. It's a very real thing too, that we don't talk about enough inside of sales. We pretend that somehow when we're at our job or we're conducting business, that our personal life just disappears and is gone. That our likes, our desires, our wants, our needs, our dreams, that suddenly those things all go away. I mean, that's not true <laughs> to, by any means, right? As somebody that struggles with depression as a sales rep, I realized that my business walk was causing my big issues because I was trying to separate it from that Dale. I was trying to forget about that Dale. And because of it, I lost sight of that Dale in the process. And these are very real things for salespeople in most cases. And they're very real for buyers. Buyers don't have good experiences in their sales cycles. They might say like, oh, that this was great, right? But behind the scenes, they're talking to somebody else. They're like, yeah, they could have done this better, but I, I still enjoyed it, <laughs> you know? And so why not strive for excellence? You know, my dad was always this, this, this being of excellence is what he always tried to control as much as he could. And if we would do that more often, the way that we create outreach methods and how it is that we interact with our prospect during these short time periods, we'll, we will change the game entirely. So this is the, the above and beyond concept, really, more than anything when we get people into this portion of the pipeline itself. It's so true, so true. I, the, the thing, I know you're getting to the wrap up here. The thing I'll never forget is like Dale Debris, basically sales Disney. <laughs> that's that's what I've saved you in my head. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Hopefully Bob Iger doesn't watch this and yeah. tell me to stop saying Disney. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, before you wrap, we get a question from Chelsea here. Loves the video 
Um, but I think a big reason that it isn't used more is the worry that spam filters are going to eat it and that uh, any time spent personalizing it is going to go to waste. So any advice for Chelsea? Yeah. So I used to, is this my Sam Chelsea again? Yeah, what's up, Chelsea? So this one was fun for me because I think, think about, think about sending emails in 2009 and 2010, hmm. right? Like, I mean, holy crap, dude. I mean, like, I don't think that ev any video ever went through on an email ever. Um, I know that Ryan O'Hara always had some really good methods for this as well. He would like build HTML code for his email mm. so that as long as you were accepting those types of things, it would show up, you know, so I've, I've heard some innovative stuff, but you can buy a tablet for $17 with an open API system on the back of it. And you can literally upload a video that will automatically play and be like the, the, the forward facing um, application when they open the thing up in the first place. It's very easy, right? It maybe costs 25 bucks when you add it all together with your time to make it happen and sticking things like that in the mail was always, we called it a one hitter quitter. So if I were to send that a tablet and, and by the way, also like I, what I would do is I would get my, my friends who were artists to, to like draw on or paint or spray paint or graffiti the tablet, you know, with the copier warrior logos or with something fun that was very relatable to the prospect that I was calling on in regards to their company um, and then I would put these things in the mail. I would, I would dress them up a little bit, maybe get a nice box, right? You, you can go as, as high as you want or as low as you want with these types of concepts. But think about the payoff, the payoff of a relationship, of a reputation, of the ability to be able to call on somebody about referrals to other people that they know in their community, right? Um, this is the question of how, how much are you willing to risk as well, too? You know, because people say all the time, I don't know if that'll work, right? Well, people told me every day of my sales career, you're stupid and this is never going to work. That's what I heard from my industry, especially this is stupid, especially my competition. Right. But then I got, you know, 44 job offers the moment that I said that I resigned from my first job and that I was looking for a new home within like the snap of a finger. I'd never, I didn't even think that that was possible. Right. But, but when you build that reputation, we do things to go above and beyond then these happen. I'd also say shout out to Vidyard um, and shout out to bomb bomb. I think that those two, uh, those two, uh, um, companies in particular have done a very good job at being able to host your video and to be able to get it to go through most, you know, barracuda networks and server problems that, you know, you run into where people don't accept video. So, yeah, I mean, I think just to state the obvious, I hope you're not actually sending and attaching a video file because um, you like, I, I think we, we're seeing del deliverability issues. You'll see that with like, if your GIF is too large, um, if it's over like a meg, it has a pretty, I, I haven't tested it recently, but I remember if it got up over a meg, um, it, it would, yeah, not go through, um, or it would, it would go through, but it would dramatically reduce your deliverability rate. And so a lot of these things, the best thing is like what Ryan was doing is he's embedding HTML in the email and that's what, that's what Vidyard's doing. And, um, I mean, if you're like, if you're able to go around email, right, like you can get them in on social media, there's so many different forms of social media, there's so many different channels for you to deliver that sort of core piece of content. And I love the, I love the phone idea. Uh, we worked with a company called Burner Rocket um, that oh, would, nice. they would automate that and do that for you. Um, I think they got, I want to say they got bought by VLG. They, and they're like the big experiential marketing uh, people. Um, so they're definitely cool people to work with. We, we sent a ton of those. We had like our initial like off back office was set up as a bit of a studio for a period of time because we were our team was sending out hundreds of these phones. Um, we had one customer wow. like, "Yeah, that's amazing. We'll put our app on it, then we'll include a little video that walks them through how to use the app, and then we'll send them out." And I was like, "Oh, great! How many do you want? Oh, like two hundred? Oh, <laughs> Cole and Nicola are going to be recording a lot of videos." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And you spoke about sending video through other platforms on social. Pro tip, anybody that's using LinkedIn right now, if you're on desktop, this does not work. But if you're on mobile, you can send video through direct message. So get on your phone, use that to send video through LinkedIn, and you can send a full-fledged, fully edited, completely compressed, like the whole nine yards video. So you can give somebody that same experience. You don't have to shoot the video natively, like through your camera directly to the app. You can upload a video via messenger on the LinkedIn application but, or app itself, but not on the desktop site. No way.
Interesting. Real life. <laughs> you can actually, I mean, I won't go into the technical details, but if you did want to do this on your, uh, on your computer, I think, oh no, because it's, it's not the mobile site, it's the mobile app, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Just the mobile app. If you do the mobile site or any, any of the, the desktop or, or web, anything web browser related, basically, you can't use the video. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Cool. I'm, uh, I'm just old school. I prefer the, uh, like, on my phone, I don't have the LinkedIn app because I, I, I hate the notifications and on all this and that. Um, I just use the mobile site, but that's a great idea. I'll have to check that out for yeah, sure. Tell me, tell me all about it. Tell me all about it, bro. I like there are days when I don't even want to open where I bury my LinkedIn app because mm. it says 99 plus, you know, notifications. I'm like, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. That's honest. why you that's why you just silence all of them. That's what I keep telling myself. That's why I silenced all these, you know, because I just don't want to know. <laughs> that's why I deleted the app. I got, got rid of all the all the social media apps on my phone. I'm like, and you're gonna die, and you're gonna die, and you're gonna die. <laughs> And, yeah. and and no more Reddit <laughs> either. Like, <laughs> it's a pro tip for salespeople unless they're using it strictly to conduct business, right? That mm -hmm. I mean, it is. It's very it's it's a very smart thing because if, during the day, if you spent more than five minutes at a time, just scrolling the feed endlessly, even if you say to yourself, "I'm looking for people that I can do business with," you're not right. And so that's a big piece of time management. But hundred percent. And as Sarah, uh, Sarah's got a, an amazing process for uh, social prospecting. Maybe we can talk about it after you wrap up your, your presentation sure. here. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so, so to, to, to finalize things, you know, really, I want everybody just to understand that the, the concept of the living pipeline is the, it's not just the future, it's your future, right? It's what it is that you're building. It's the concept of not missing out on opportunities, but instead building relationships and filling your branches. It's the idea of heading to your roots and understanding that those roots run through soil even. And, and that there's grass on the surface and that there's bugs and that there's, there's good and bad things. And so that awareness of self and the understanding of the ecosystem that you exist in as well too. This is all about structure. If you don't have a structure as a salesperson, it's, it's literally just never gonna work the way that you want it to. You can still make six figures doing it, but imagine being making six figures and being in control of your sales, your sales outcomes, right? Because that's what a process does for you, less stress, more confidence and and that your prospect can feel that too right but remember too that the, that the system is fluid that i've created and that i i'm trying to help people to adapt to right think about marketing think about communication principles think about experiences remember relevance remember familiarity remember this idea of relationship building and then you know understand too again that the branches are, are fluent with each other right? They, they don't just, you don't just put somebody in a branch and, and label them and never move them anywhere else. You know, this is not about some kind of exclusive type of, of prospect. And this is about creating inclusivity inside of your process. And so I would encourage everybody to get rid of their old, rusted, leaky pipeline. It's broken. It's done, right? But instead start feeding your living pipeline and reap the harvest.